Good morning, church. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. I invite you to look at your insert, the chronicle in your order of worship. There's information there that will help you stay apprised of ministries and scheduling for the weeks ahead. Under the announcement sheet, I call your attention particularly to the note about a congregational vote on August 14th. Um, at that time, the congregation will have the opportunity to vote on the deacon's recommendation that this church officially becomes a cooperative Baptist fellowship church, partnering with the CBF Global and CBF North Carolina. If you have questions about that, I invite you to come see me or talk with perhaps some others within the congregation that you know are more informed about who the cooperative Baptist fellowship is. It's my understanding that uh, representatives from CBF North Carolina have been here several, several times and have spoken with you about what partnership might look like. But if you do have questions, please do ask. Also, if you look in your order of worship, the last hymn, there's a different text there than what we are, are used to for the tune Holy Manna. So to prepare you for that, the tune Holy Manna is the one we normally sing with brethren we have met to worship. Brethren we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. So this text fits beautifully with that tune. And just wanted to give you a heads up about that. And one more heads up that the choir and I were talking about before they came in. Um, after the hymn, right before the offertory prayer, would you please remain standing for that prayer? And if you sit down, don't worry about it. That's probably what you were used to. But if you would, would try after that hymn to uh, remain standing for the offertory prayer. And then finally, in terms of praying for one another, uh, Pam Layfield has given me permission to share a matter of prayer with you. She has a history of lung cancer. An appointment on Friday, July 19th, revealed that they believe it has returned. A PET scan is scheduled for this Friday. Um, she is already feeling your prayers. It went out on the prayer warrior list earlier, uh, earlier this weekend. But please do hold Pam and Sandy and family in your prayers. And we can even pray for good news on Friday. That's what we'd like to hear. So, let's begin, shall we, to worship our loving God. Welcome. The congregation would like to join me in reciting Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down and bring my treasures. He leads me beside the city of Christ. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff that come comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Gracious God, through love you open the doors wide and welcome us into your presence, saints and sinners alike. You provide us so many blessings each day and we are eternally grateful. We come with joy to your house to worship with you and experience your presence. We celebrate your grace and mercy in our lives. May your spirit inspire our praise and thanksgiving, our prayers and petitions as we worship together in your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.
Our Old Testament today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 6. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall no longer fear or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the the word word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for giving shape and meaning to the ancient image of yourself as shepherd through the person of Jesus Christ. In him, your compassion has been eternally revealed, giving your rod and staff the human face of love. Through Jesus' persistence, even to death, in seeking and saving the lost, your goodness and mercy has been abundantly experienced. His ongoing life continues to guide and lead us in paths of righteousness. How can we do other than praise and adore you, O God, and listen to Jesus' voice as he calls us to follow him? And yet we confess that there are times when we fail to hear and obey his call because our lives are so filled with activities and noise. Forgive us, O God, for the times when we fail to reach out and accompany those who are going through difficult times, those who feel imprisoned in a valley of shadows and find themselves overwhelmed by life. Jesus, Good Shepherd, help us to take the time and make the space to hear your call to us, the call to reveal your love, compassion, and comfort wherever you need us to bind up the wounds of the victims of today's society, the call to reveal in tangible and authentic ways your passion for those who feel powerless to make any changes for good in their lives the call to empty ourselves of all that is contrary to your life within us so that your goodness and mercies are enjoyed, not as rewards to be hoarded, but as gifts to be shared. In your name, O Christ, we pray. Amen. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For we were going astray like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd, who is the guardian of our soul. So hear this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are sought, we are found, and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
This is the epistle lesson from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For our prayer of intercession today, our prayers of the people, we're going to sing the prayer through the hymn, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. But before we sing, I invite you to think of those for whom you would like to pray. We've already mentioned Pam. You'll see on the communion table some bright colored ribbons wrapped around the table. Last Sunday, for our prayers of the people, everyone was given the opportunity to tie a knot in one of the ribbons. That knot represented someone for whom they wanted to pray. And then we prayed over them. I've left them there on purpose. If there's someone for whom you want to pray, you can come tie a knot while we sing or at the close of service if you want to come add your knot to the ribbons. Pam, I added yours this morning. So we will pray by singing Savior like a shepherd lead us. Your order of worship indicates for you to stand, but I think you ought to remain seated. Let us pray.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts, acknowledging your many blessings in our lives. As we come to you now with our offerings, we do so in a spirit of thanksgiving and worship. We recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We are merely stewards of your generosity. We now ask that you bless these gifts and the giver and use them for the furtherance of your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
These kids have probably heard me tell this story before, but I thought it would be appropriate today. So before I joined the church here and was still a member of the church that I went to in Rockingham at Beverly Hills Baptist Church, there was a retired preacher that um, was a member of the church, and one Sunday he uh, was in line to speak to the pastor as he was going out, and he said, um, he went by and he shook the preacher's hand like this, and he said, Tony, are you holding on to your corner of the blanket? And then Mr. Johnny went out of the church, went back and got at the back of the line, came by the preacher again, and he said, you ain't going to let me shake your hand. Tony, are you holding on to your corner of the blanket? Well, guess what Mr. Johnny did? Surely somebody would guess. He got out of line and went back and got in the back of the line again. And he got to the preacher again and he said, Tony, are you holding on to your corner of the blanket? Well, then at that time, Tony was like, What's wrong with Preacher Johnny? He keeps coming through my line or coming through the line and he asks me the same question every time. So the fourth time he went back and got at the end of the line and he said, Tony, are you holding on to your corner of the blanket? And that time the preacher, Tony, took Mr. Johnny by the hand and pulled him over there with him and said, you wait right here. So when everybody got through and he was standing there talking to him, he said, Preacher Johnny, what are you saying to me? Every time you come through the line, you keep coming through the line and you keep asking me, if I'm holding on to my corner of the blanket. And Preacher Johnny said, You see, Tony, there was a man who needed to see Jesus. He was paralyzed, and he couldn't get there. So his friends placed him on a blanket, and each of them took a corner. Can I have four volunteers? You're in the middle. You're not, you don't get to hold a corner. Okay, come I need four of you to grab a corner and stand up here. I'm not going to make them carry a cow through the church. So, so, and they all took their friend on the roof of the building. And they lowered him down to where Jesus was. And the man, Jesus told him, I see of your great faith. Go now and your sins be forgiven you. And he was able to walk away from the blanket He was paralyzed, and he couldn't walk. But when he saw Jesus, Jesus healed him, and he made him free, and he was able to walk again. Isn't that a wonderful story? That each of us have a corner of the blanket in life that we have to hold on to so that others can see and know the forgiveness and the healing of our lives and of our infirmities because of great faith. Everyone has a job to do out there. Whether they're in church or not, they have a corner of the blanket that they have to hold on to. Can y'all remember that? Everybody has a corner of the blanket to hold on to so others can know Jesus and can be healed and be forgiven of their sins. Okay? I challenge you, Big kids, you've got a corner of the blanket to hold on to, too. I encourage you to find your corner of the blanket and leave your life so that others can see Jesus. Okay? Let's pray together. For our faith, Lord, we give you thanks and praise. For the story and the witness we see in the friends of the sick man how they needed to get him to the Savior to Jesus and their great faith in taking on that role of holding their corner of the blanket that they may get their friend to your son Jesus may we all be challenged to hold on to our corner of the blanket and let others come to know Jesus as we do forgive us lord where we have failed you and where we have sinned 
These things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. As we continue worshiping, may God be with you there. And children, you say to them, may God be with you here. We now come to our gospel lesson for today. It's from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Let us hear again the word of the Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Jesus said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gesenaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who he touched were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, there's some distress here. We don't know what that is, but we can certainly pray. So let us pray together. Lord, we have watched two of our sisters in Christ depart this place seemingly distressed. And how we thank you for those whose love is so much that they went to check and are even now trying to help. May your spirit help them know what to do. May there be calm in this circumstance. And whatever is needed, we pray you would provide. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of us here today are of an age who can remember when the personal computers first started to become popular. Advertisers, technology gurus, and efficiency experts all touted the same sales pitch. A personal computer will save you time. By the 1970s and 80s, Luke Dormel of Digital Trends writes, the idea that technology would free us from drudgery and give us all more free time was everywhere. In the 1979 book, The Mighty Micro, author Christopher Evans predicted how technology will have advanced by the millennium, which we have surpassed, to the point that we can enjoy, get this, a 20-hour work week, and retirement at 50. A 20-hour work week and retirement at 50. 
44 years later, we're still working 40 plus hours a week. In retirement, in the United States, the average age of the retired is 63. Though the personal computer hasn't resulted in those 20 hour a week uh, work times, and it has not allotted us more free time, technology experts keep trying to help us get there. Remember the BlackBerry cell phones? They were all the rage. At meetings and conferences, you would see people pull out those black handheld devices, their stylus, they were checking their calendars, they were updating their to-do list, they were organizing their lives on those Blackberries. But the Blackberries got left behind when the iPhone and Androids came on the scene. With this technology, there are a variety of apps to help us organize our life and manage our time. There's Google, Calendar, Todoist, Any.Do, Thing3, Trello, Evernote, Habatica, TikTok, Notion, and Microsoft Outlook. And that's just the top 10. Those devices and their apps are certainly helpful, but they still haven't really saved us much time. So you would think that with 21st century technology, printed cal calendars, planners, and organizers, etc., would have gone the way of the BlackBerry. But oh no. Sales of printed calendars remain constant. On Amazon's website, you can choose from 8,000 varieties. 8,000. With a smartphone in one hand and a pencil in the other, we're still scheduling the mess out of our lives. And all that free time that we're supposed to have because of them? Truth is, we're busier than ever and in dire need of help with time management. Thankfully, in today's gospel reading, Jesus offers us just that. The scene unfolds with the disciples coming to Jesus to share with him all that they had done and taught. Jesus listened to them, but he also noticed that so many were coming and going to the disciples that they didn't even have time to eat. So Jesus said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. And they went away in the boat to that deserted place and were by themselves. Always the teacher, Jesus invited the disciples to do what he himself often did. Retreat in silence, rest in God's presence, and once refueled, return to minister to those in need. Retreat, rest, return. Jesus modeled this threefold rhythm throughout the Synoptic Gospels. Mark 1, 35-39 reads, In the morning while it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, retreat, and there he prayed, rest. And Simon and his companions hunted for Jesus. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. So he answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went out through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Return. Luke 4, 42. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place. Retreat. Rest. The crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. Return. Luke 5, 16. He would withdraw to deserted places, retreat, 
and pray. Rest. In the next verses, Jesus heals the paralytic whose friends had lowered him through a roof so that he could get to Jesus. Return. Matthew 14, 13. He withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Retreat and rest. In the following verses, Jesus feeds more than 5,000 people. Return. Matthew 14, 23. He went up the mountain by himself, retreat, to pray, rest. And in the following verses, Jesus heals the sick and Gennesaret. Return. Retreat in silence. Rest in God's presence. And once refueled, return to minister to those in need. What might this pattern look like for us as individuals, as families, and as a church? Let's begin with the individuals and families. As we're scheduling activities, writing them in our planners or typing them into our smartphones or computers, why don't we make it a habit to take a look at the bigger picture of our lives? and how we're spending our time. And in doing so, actually schedule times of retreat. <clears throat> now some of you may be thinking, I could possibly schedule a time of retreat maybe once a year. That would be a good practice. But Jesus included regular times of retreat and rest in his daily life. We should follow his lead. We could schedule 30 minutes of silence into our daily plans, actually write it in our calendars, post it on our devices. We could schedule family meals together. Wouldn't that be a welcome retreat from those whose mealtimes have become drive-through, eat-it, fast food adventures in between activities? We could remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Do you have Sabbath rest on your calendar? Now let's turn to churches. Jesus offers a cautionary word to his disciples and the contemporary church. Karen Marie Yust writes, We need times when we return from our individual activities, even those activities done in the name of and for the sake of Jesus, and reform ourselves as the body of Christ. Otherwise, we may be broken and poured out so often that we struggle to be useful to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. You know what that looks like. You're on five teams. You volunteer with blessings in a book bag. You teach Sunday school. You lead our youth ministry. You sing in choir. You take care of this building. You plan, cook, serve, and clean up for meals. You serve with Anson Crisis Ministries. And these are all wonderful things. The church must counter its busyness with retreat and rest, even as it remembers the Sabbath and keep it holy. Retreat in silence. Rest in God's presence, and once refueled, return to minister to those in need. There's another time management lesson in today's gospel reading. It's found beginning in verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognized them, that is, Jesus and the disciples, and they hurried there on foot from all of the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as Jesus went ashore, He saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Though Jesus wanted the disciples to have a time of retreat and rest, and even wanted that for himself, he knew there are times that rest must be rescheduled for later. 
He discerned that the needs of those in the crowd must be addressed. The opportunity for retreat and rest would come soon, would come later. Keeping Sabbath and serving others is a vital part of our relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Following Jesus' lead, we as a church and as individual disciples of Jesus must seek the Holy Spirit's help in knowing when to rest and when to serve. So whether you use a smartphone, other technology, or a printed calendar to organize your life, I encourage you and me to look at the big picture of our lives and find times to retreat and rest. Schedule those times into our calendars and discipline ourselves to use that time well. My iWatch tells me when it's time to stand up. Surely I can schedule it to tell me when to rest. Retreat in silence. Doesn't that sound good? Rest in God's presence. Don't we need that? And once refueled, and oh, how we need to be refueled, return to minister to those in need. <clears throat> this is what Jesus modeled for us. Therefore, may we do likewise. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our shepherd God, you call us into a pattern of work and rest that our lives may be the better for it. So shape our leisure and our labor that the world will recognize us as Jesus' disciples and our ministry as what you would have us do and when to do it. In his name we pray. Amen. During the hymn of response, you are invited to indeed respond. Be it something you and God talk about right where you're standing while you're singing, or perhaps you would like to join this congregation officially and become a member of First Baptist Wadesboro. Perhaps you have never claimed Jesus Christ as your Lord, and today is the day you want to make that most important decision. I'll be down front to welcome any who come. Let us stand and sing and respond. <laughs>
Gay just shared with me that um, Vicki had a blood pressure spike and they've got it going down, but they're waiting for the ambulance to come and get her. And she asked for us to stay here and she'll let us know when we can be dismissed. So let's pray again. God, we know just a bit more about what is going on with Vicki. But you know full well. You even know the number of hairs on her head. So because we love her, we place her before you, asking for your presence and for your healing. May your spirit guide medical personnel to do what needs to be done so that she might be restored to wellness and can come back into this place and worship with us again fully well, rejoicing in all that you have done for her. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you stand, please, for the benediction? Let us depart from this place with Vicki still in our hearts and prayerfully in our minds. And as we depart also, may we consider how God is calling you to retreat, to rest, to refuel, and return to serve in Jesus' name. Amen.